Hey guys, Scott from Aristocob.com here, and with me once again is my father, retired Colonel Calvin Markwood. Good afternoon. I, I, I want to salute you. I don't yeah. know why. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Never had that urge before, but uh, introducing you does that to me. Anyway, about a month ago, I think it yeah. was, in the dark, we had a conversation that was a, a bit of a teaser because I knew that we were going to have some time together this month, and uh, I had hoped to get my dad on camera talking about a couple things that relate to his uh, his time in uh, well your time in the military I guess would be the easiest way to say it It'll work you were a lot of places yeah. <laughs> and so uh, let me turn at least a part of this over to my dad and uh, he's going to share with us a little bit about his uh, his memories of his time when 1967 okay okay uh, 1967 was when I spent a year, almost a year, flying combat missions in North Vietnam, over North Vietnam, based in Thailand. Uh, I'm going to talk to a, a slideshow that I've used with several of my grandchildren's classes at school uh, to, to tell them what flying and fighting is all about. And, and, and I'll, make, I'll superimpose and, that so you guys can see what what we're seeing. Yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk about what's on the slides and then Scott will slide them in there for, uh, for you to see. So the, the first uh, slide is, is simply an introduction to, to me. That I've also used this in, in a church setting and uh, our, our senior pastor commented that that's the first time he'd ever seen this group of seniors quiet for 20 minutes. <laughs> so, and that includes all of his sermons, so uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting too. Uh, at the bottom of the first slide, I, I have a slogan that was, was mounted on the walls of our briefing room in, in the base in Thailand. It says, the mission of the Air Force is to fly and fight, and don't you forget it. So that was what it was all about. A uh, little bit about me. I was born in Denver, Colorado. I just turned 79, so the slide says a long time ago, and that'll tell you how, how long it was. Uh, I was a kid during World War II. I was, this, was the second of three brothers at that time. The family grew after that, but, but during World War II, uh, we were all fascinated by airplanes. We were fascinated by cars, by motorcycles, bicycles, anything. That went. Girls. Not yet. That came, that came a little <laughs> okay, later. Yeah, I was okay, only not six. Too. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> after I finished school, and by the way, I, I did become interested in girls. <laughs> Thank I, I went goodness. To, I went to the University of Colorado and graduated in 1956. Uh, now I started out, when I started out, the Korean War was going on and when you gradu graduated from high school you had two choices. You either went to college and got a deferment or you were drafted. So I went the deferment route. Uh, I went into the Air Force ROTC and uh, you know, with the goal, always with the goal of, of going into the Air Force and flying. I gave the Navy a, a little peek, uh, but they didn't offer me a full scholarship and so I went the other direction. Uh, after I graduated in 56, I waited a year and then went on active duty, went to pilot training, uh, had many good years and experiences for 25 years. Uh, during that time, I, I had a number of, of assignments. Most of them were in, in uh, headquarters or, or R&D program jobs. Uh, I did spend the one year in, in uh, Vietnam uh, flying the F-105. During that year, to, to finish a tour in the F-105, you had to fly a hundred combat missions over North Vietnam. We, we flew a few other missions that were in Laos, the target areas were in Laos, but they weren't counters. And so I flew 108 total, and, uh, <clears throat> and the hundred of those 108 were actually over North Vietnam. Uh, after that, I came back and spent some more years in R&D jobs. Finally, in 1981, uh, 25 years under my belt, I retired. My last assignment in the Air Force was as the Deputy Director of the F-16 program during the first three years that we were, were in production and deploying uh, the F-16 in the United States Air Force and four Air Forces in Europe and Israel and getting ready to do most of the world 
uh, with a very good airplane. Did, did you mention what you studied in, in college? No. Because you say you're a pilot, they get that, yes. but it, uh, besides that, you're something else, right? Yeah, my, my undergraduate degree was in mechanical engineering, and then I went back to graduate school for two years at the expense of, of the U.S. government, thank you're, you, you're, one and all, welcome. taxpayers one and all, and got a master's in aeronautical engineering. Okay. So both of those fit in with flying and with the, with the various jobs that I had. So after a quarter of a century, then I retired from the Air Force and went back home. Uh, we ended up in Littleton, Colorado, which is a suburb of Denver. Denver's where I grew up. Good. Any questions? You can ask your questions when you've seen this and get back online, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the, the next picture is a, is a picture of the group of guys that I went through F-105 uh, transition training in. I had not dropped any bombs or done any air-to-air -air gunnery uh, prior to the time I was picked to go fly the 105, so I spent six months in Las Vegas at Nellis Air Force Base uh, learning to fly the airplane and, and uh, mm -hmm. getting ready to perform the mission. Uh, of this group of guys that I have in the picture, and, and when you see it online, you'll see circles and dashes above the heads or below the, the bodies of the guys in the picture. We had 11 out of about 17 guys that trained. 11 of us actually flew combat missions. And of those 11, we had six of them that were shot down. Uh, one of them was taken prisoner, and in 1972, he was released and, and came back. The rest of them uh, were, were lost there, killed in action. So they, they told us going over that our loss rate would be about 40% in 100 missions, and five out of 11 was right around 40%. So we were right on target as far as, as that's concerned. Uh, it was a dangerous mission, needless to say. And, and the losses were a number of different ways for depending on who we're talking about. But, uh, I won't go into detail on any of those. <clears throat> if you don't know where uh, Southeast Asia is, you can look at your map. Uh, there'll be a map that'll show up in the slideshow. Stuck on the south side of China is, is a peninsula that has, uh, has North and South Vietnam at that time. They're united, of course, now under the, the communist government. It also had Laos and Thailand and Cambodia. Uh, that, that's in between India and, and Japan, basically. So look at your map and you'll see uh, what was there. Uh, I, next is a more detailed map just of that peninsula where you can see uh, Thailand. And I have a bunch of red stars that show, show bases that the United States Air Force had, had uh, wings of airplanes in. Uh, most of them were joint bases with the Royal Thai Air Force, so we had, had interesting relationships there. All good. You know, the Thai people were wonderful hosts and, and, uh, and good friends at that time. And then, then along the eastern border of the peninsula was North and South Vietnam, both kind of tall and skinny. Uh, North Vietnam looked like the hind leg of a dog. It was, it was wide up at the top where it borders on China and then narrower down, sandwiched in between the Tonkin Gulf and, and the country of Laos. Laos was a pretty primitive country, and most of our targets there were, were, uh, were storage areas along trails or, or roads through the jungle, awfully hard to see any targets and, and, uh, and do very much. So that's, that's the layout of the war. I, I was stationed at, at two bases there, one just northeast of Bangkok, uh, called Karat Royal Thai Air Force Base, and one up to the left called Tak Lee uh, Royal Thai Air Force Base also. Tak Lee was considered the Wild West town of Thailand and uh, was kind of a rough town. Karat was, was much more dignified. On over toward the border were a couple of bases that had F-4 squadrons and, and one that had primarily helicopters and uh, A-1s. The A-1 was a Navy propeller-driven World War II airplane that could carry a lot of ammo and a lot of, of bombs and, and fly for a long, long time. And we used those primarily for search and rescue airplanes. Uh, some of them were used to spot targets and, and mark them for us, but, but that was kind of rare. So the next slide, uh, this is a picture of the F-105 with its our normal bomb load, you'll see that there are six bombs that are mounted on a pylon on the bottom of the, of the fuselage of the airplane. Those were 750-pound bombs most of the time. 
Once in a while we had 500 pound bombs, we called them lady fingers, which were the, you know, the little mini firecrackers that you could hold in your hand and let them go off. Uh, actually, they were good bombs, but, but the 750s were World War II leftovers and we were using them up. Did, did they not. have any guidance on them? No, these were dumb bombs. These were just gravity bombs, okay? Mm -hmm. um, on the outboard side of that, there's a, a large fuel tank. We had one fuel tank on each wing. Uh, we had another load that had two 3,000 pound bombs that went in place of those fuel tanks, and then we had a 650 gallon tank that went on the belly. So we could fly either way. If you look closely, you'll see another pylon that's even further out than that. Uh, we put a pod on one side that carried uh, radar jamming equipment to help protect us against the anti-aircraft uh, radar, the SAM guidance radars, or we could put a Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile on it. And typically we would fly with a pod on one wing and an air-to-air -air missile on you the other. SAM. SAM means what? SAM, surface-to-air missiles. So the okay. guys on the ground shooting We're shooting at you. big telephone pole-sized <laughs> missiles at us, yes. Wow. Yeah. These were, these were supposedly pretty primitive uh, Russian missiles and primitive uh, guidance systems on it. Uh, if you didn't have any protection, they were not that primitive, okay, <laughs> and could hurt you really bad. Uh, the F-105 also had a Gatling gun, a 20 millimeter cannon on it that would fire uh, 6,000 rounds a minute. Now that's 100 rounds a second, and if you can imagine that, these things are a half an inch in diameter and, and big, high explosive. Uh, rounds, and if you could get what you wanted in front of you, you know, they could do an awful lot of damage and were, were a good weapon. How, weapon. how many of those did you have on board? We uh, could carry uh, about rounds. 1,200 rounds. Okay. So, so you had 12 seconds. Okay. <clears throat> Probably the most I ever fired was, was about an 800 round burst, and, and that was one day we were going along a, a road in a mountain. Uh, we were allowed to go down this particular road. Now, I'm talking about a dirt road, a shelf road along the side of a mountain. And we were allowed to go down there on, on what was called arm reconnaissance. If we could see a target, we could shoot at it. And these were roads that the trucks were bringing supplies down. Mm -hmm. Well, in the daytime, there were no trucks. And, and one day I was leading a flight along one of these roads and said, if I were a truck driver and the sun came up, where would I hide? And, and I saw a place where the road made about a 90 degree turn from one side of the mountain to the other, and I said, that's shallower than the sides of a normal road. So I rolled in and fired about 800 rounds into that area, and as I pulled out, the, the guys in the flight behind me started hooping and hollering. <laughs> and, and they asked me when we got back, how did you find those, those trucks? It was probably uh, petroleum storage and ammo storage, as well as trucks and stuff that you'd have mm -hmm. there. And they said, how did you find them? And my answer was, with my brain. Okay? <laughs> I didn't see anything. I just just try to figure out where they would you be. You used, used the force. The force, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the F-105 was a heavy airplane. It, it was about as heavy as the World War II B-17, about the same size fuselage as a B-17, a heck of a lot less wing, and that was a problem. That, that was good news and bad news. It allowed the airplane to be very, very fast. It didn't allow it to turn very well. Hmm. And so you had to use that tactically in, in a number of ways. <clears throat> But it was, it was a good airplane. It was very, very tough and could take a lot of battle damage. Now, the good news is that in 108 missions, I didn't have any battle damage uh, on an airplane I was flying, and, I, and none of the th other three guys in a flight with me ever had any battle damage when I was with them. So I'm not did, sure. Did, they, did. <laughs> did that, that put you in high demand? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Probably. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't advertise it, okay? It was something you don't brag about because you're afraid you'll break the chain at that point. Okay. Anyway, another picture of it showing the airplane taxiing out. You can get, just get a little, little different view of the airplane. And then an airplane uh, on the way to the, to the target. Uh, it's a beautiful airplane as far as I'm concerned, and, and it was a real, uh, real thrill to fly it. If you look at this one, you can see that there are some funny spikes sticking out on the front of some of the bombs. And those were called fuse extenders. Uh, they caused the bomb to go off not after it hit the ground, but about three feet in the air. And that was useful if, if you were trying to shut off anti-aircraft guns or take out SAM sites and, and so forth. Uh, called it a daisy cutter when it had that, mm. that uh, configuration on it. You can see on this one they're carrying an extra bomb out on the pylon on the wing. 
I didn't ever fly with the eight bomb configuration because we had the the other garbage to carry it. Hmm. Primarily, this was an earlier earlier mission. <clears throat> we didn't have enough fuel to to go all the way to our targets and back with the fuel that was in the airplane. Uh, so on the way, we would join up with the KC-135 uh, tanker. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, maneuver that that we performed. We would go in uh, again as a four ship. Our primarily primary combat crew was four guys in four different airplanes, okay? And, and so as we'd go to the tanker, the lead guy would go on the boom first, and the other three airplanes would fly formation on the tanker. As he would get full, he would swing off to one side, and the guy on the opposite side would swing in. If you can imagine braiding here, what it would be, be kind of this one, then this one, then this one. And, and typically we would refuel, get everybody full, and then each one would go back on for a few more seconds of fuel to just top it off. And that way we would have all the fuel we could take. Uh, Where's the fourth guy in this picture? Taking the picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got any more questions? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> and another view of, the, of being on the tanker, you can see the guy on the tanker. And again, this is the fourth guy taking the picture because you can see the other three airplanes in there. And, and once you learn to do that, it was it was pretty good, but it was kind of scary when you first were starting. You know, you never wanted your airplane to touch anything else in, unless it was the ground with the wheels down. And now you're letting an airplane stick a steel rod in your in your nose and, and take fuel. But mm -hmm. but you got used to it. You had to learn to fly formation on the tanker, not on the boom. And and then the boom operator who was in the back of the airplane would stick the probe in and and uh, mm -hmm. and transfer fuel. Pretty neat. Okay, another, another picture of the map. When we went from Thailand up into North Vietnam, we would either go overland, which would have us flying over Laos, and then coming in from the west side of the country, or we would go across uh, in the demilitarized zone between North and South Vietnam into the South China Sea, the, the Gulf of Tonkin, and come in from the east side. And, and we had targets throughout the area there. I don't know if you can see it, but about, well, you see the red circle that I've put in on Kep Airfield, just down and to the left of that was Hanoi. And, and uh, you know, that was the capital city. The, the missiles were, were in that, that kind of light-colored region north of Hanoi uh, to, the, to the northeast of Kep. Uh, the rest of the country was pretty mountainous. So, so the targets were mostly in what we call the Red River Valley. The Red River came in there from about 11 o'clock and came down across past Hanoi and then out to the to the Tonkin Gulf. And that was where the the SAMs were, that was where most of the guns were, although throughout the country you, if you had a decent target, it was a target worth attacking, uh, they would move guns in. Our, our commanders in Washington, this was, was McNamara was the Secretary of Defense and he tried to run the war with his deputy President Johnson uh, <laughs> from, from, from the White House and so we would oftentimes get a target assigned to us and, and would be sent back there morning and afternoon for five straight days or six straight days. And, and recce airplanes would go over and take pictures and if they weren't satisfied that we'd sufficiently destroyed it, we'd be going back. Well, the North Vietnamese learned that very quickly and so they would move guns into any target. You know, the second or third day would start to get hot. First day on a target would be pretty, pretty safe. Something I didn't point out on this, if you look at the map closely, you'll see at the bottom, uh, where close to that bottom right hand blue arrow, it says RP-1 and RP-2, RP-3. Those were called root packages, R-U-T-E packages. And they were the way the country was divided up to, to assign targets. Uh, <clears throat> root package 2, 3, and 4 were pretty much Navy country. Uh, root package 1, and five were Air Force country, and five and six were Navy and Air Force, depending on. The, the major targets were in Route Pack 6 up there at the top right side, and that was when that was where you'd uh, find the biggest threat. The, the SAMs were all up there. I don't know of any SAMs while I was there that were down in the, in the lower Route Packs. Route Pack 1, 2, and 3 were primarily where they were shipping uh, gear on trucks, bicycles, dogs, people's backs and so forth. The Ho Chi Minh Trail ran down there, down through that area, and also into Laos, parallel to that, uh, through the jungle uh, into South Vietnam to, to uh, supply the, the Viet Cong as well as the North Vietnamese soldiers that were down there. So 
part of our goal was to shut off that flow of supply. The stuff would come in from China up to the north, and it was also, would also come in uh, by sea, and British ships, Russian ships, Chinese ships, a lot, a lot of our friends were hauling stuff in for the, for the Vietnamese to use against us. Nice. Yeah, nice. One of my friends strafed a Russian ship in the harbor there and got himself and, and the deputy commander of, of the other uh, F-105 wing in trouble because they tried to cover it up and, mm. and it didn't work. You know, it took them about four hours to sort it out and, and, uh, and they both got canned for it. So mostly we had to leave the ships alone in spite of the fact that we knew what they were doing and, mm. and, and could do it. we couldn't go into China either. We had a 10, 10 mile wide uh, buffer zone along the Chinese border that we weren't supposed to go into at all. Uh, there were guys who got, got hit and were trying to get out and, and accidentally flew into to the buffer zone. And in fact, one airplane uh, on a night mission that had my name painted on the cockpit went down in China. So no thanks for that. Mm. The, the crew ended up back in, in Vietnam as prisoners of war, but, uh, but the airplane actually went down in China. Next slide. When, when we went up to, to do our bombing missions, uh, we flew in a flight of four, and, and then four flights of four joined into a kind of a box, a square box formation, two in the front, two in the back, so that we were all, all jamming at the same time, sending out our radar jamming signals, and, and supposedly that was to put a, a bright yellow line on their radar scopes that they couldn't pick, pick out any single airplane to shoot at it, and, and it was quite effective. When we got to the target, uh, we had to roll in to dive bomb the target in a, in a 45 degree uh, dive, and we would do that one flight. Is that, is that so you could release your bombs? Is that why you had to be? It, it, was, it was to get us from a high altitude where only the, the big guns and the missiles could shoot at us to a low altitude that was good for releasing, and, and most accuracy was in a 45 degree dive. Okay. So we would then, then release the bombs at about six, 7,000 feet above the ground, and then do a turn as we pulled out, and that was to keep them from being able to to, to track us as well. Uh, if you can imagine a Thunderbird or Blue Angels flight with with the formation turns, that's exactly what we did. Only as the right hand diagram shows, as we rolled in, we would trade positions. So we had one, two, three, and four. As we rolled in, number one would would guide the flight. Number two would slide under him to the other side and three and four would dive into the inside. And then we'd all roll out, and we had that same formation, only a mirror image of it, diving down to the target. We'd all release at basically the same time. And as we pulled out, we did that, that trade again. Okay. So it, it was a real fun, smooth uh, thing to fly if somebody wasn't shooting at you. But it was even good because <laughs> uh, it helped you keep from getting hit. We could get 16 airplanes down and on the target and out in real short time, and that made them divide up their guns to shoot at us, okay? So it, it reduced the threat a whole lot. The, the second flight that rolled in had cluster bombs or the bombs with the daisy cutters, okay? And, and as they would roll in, number one would start to roll in and the guns would turn on. So number, the second flight would then look to see which guns were firing, which gun sites were firing. They would pick the ones on the far side of the target and put their cluster bombs or their daisy cutters or their 3,000 pound bombs, which were great anti-personnel weapons, uh, put them on them to give us the best chance coming out. Then three and four would have bombs. So again, it was, it was a kind of a precision maneuver, fun to fly, very effective in what we did. We had the two F-105 bases, and the other base didn't adopt that, that technique for probably six months after we did. They, they used a, a, a tactic that was developed in Europe for the one-day World War III war, and that was to go in at low altitude, pop up when they approached the target, and roll in one airplane at a time. And, and they lost a lot of airplanes until they finally caught on. Mm. You know. One of, one of those kind of things, okay? Uh, th there's a photograph there that was taken of Kep Airfield. Remember that on the map I showed the airfield with a, a circle around it? Uh, you, you can see kind of 
above the center and right on the runway, you can see a, a bunch of, of flashes. Those are bombs going off, and, and it was a bright flash. Uh, up from that, you can see the dust cloud and the smoke cloud from another flight's bombs. Very close to the runway on the right-hand side, you can see another, another white plume. Uh, I'll talk about those a little bit. The, the white plume that you see to the right was, was cluster bombs going off. Yeah. There. Cluster bombs going off around an a anti-aircraft site. Now, you, if you could get a magnifying glass, you could actually find the revetments where the guns were located, and they would typically be in a circle around a central radar control van. Okay, six or eight, and, and they were 37 millimeter, which we didn't worry about too much, 57 millimeter, which we worried about a lot because they had a lot of them, and 85 millimeters, which were, which were a nightmare. They didn't have many, and they typically fired at us when we, were, when we were quite high, and on this particular mission, they damaged, I, I got to remember the numbers again, it's been a long time, they damaged 11 out of 16 airplanes just as we were rolling in, mm. and right right up at, so at our not, entry not formation. Not the first night of attacking yeah. that target. The, the flight of four I was in came out squeaky clean again. That was that was one of the good deals. The The big glow kind of in the center of the, of the runway there uh, was the flight that I was in, and and as we rolled in, we did this, this formation rolling that I described a little bit ago, so I was number two. As I crossed under the leader and we, we were in the dive, as soon as we rolled out, then, then you quit looking at your formation guy, except with one eye, and, and you look at your gun sight to see where it is. Well, the, the aim point for our flight was right dead center, <laughs> and I knew we had it wired. So, so I did a maneuver that, that made all of the bombs go in the same place. And, and if you looked at a series of these photos, and, and I have, have about five photos of the bombs going off, you can see one going off right in the middle of the runway, and then that thing just got bigger and bigger and hmm. bigger and bigger as they just kind of stacked so you, in. So you released them simultaneously, is that? No, you released them 12 mil 120 milliseconds, okay, a little over a tenth of a second apart, and that was automatic in the airplane. And, and if you were just flying normally, that would spread them out about 400 feet, okay? okay? What I did was I went zero Gs, so as they came off, they were nose to tail instead huh. of spread out, okay? So they're just falling in a, in a cluster right together, only, only a tiny bit spacing this way. And, uh, and that really did it. When, when we were briefing to go up there, the guy that was my flight leader said, I've been up there six times, and they know we're coming, and they know what we do. And every time we roll in to the left, drop our bombs, roll out to the left, and head back out to the Gulf, because that's the quickest way to get to water and, and, and rescue if you get hit. He says, when we release our bombs, we're going to come back to the right instead and fly along the runway for a little bit, and then we'll come back left. And, and we did that, and that was part of why we took no hits. The mm -hmm. guys that did the normal thing and pulled out, if they weren't hit by the 85 millimeters before they rolled in, they got hit by 57s as they, mm -hmm. as they flew on out. So that was good leading, good, good thinking on the part of this guy, who, by the way, was a B-52 aircraft commander before he flew the F-105. Wow. So, he was. He knew he, how to drop a bomb. He well. He was a sharp cookie and uh, and knew how to stay alive. Okay, was the most important thing that did. Anyway, that was Cap Airfield's story, and and that was a good day. A little more to the story. As we came back, as we flew down the runway and came back around to the left, the, this flight leader looked out ahead of us, and you could see if the flight that was ahead of us was all of them were streaming smoke, and some of them fuel and hydraulic fluid and such, and, and we knew that they were vulnerable to, to SAM attack because they probably didn't have any pods left on their airplanes. So, so when he saw that we were all, all in good shape, he drove our flight right over the top of this other flight, flight to shepherd him out to sea. Hmm. He got a silver star for, for that thick. Wow. Okay, next I have a calendar for the month of October. Uh, October and November we're at the end of the monsoon season, and we had good weather for, for a couple of months, and so we flew an awful lot of missions. Uh, during that six weeks, all of October, first two weeks of, of uh, November, the two bases lost a total of 45 F-105s, and, and the, the calendar that I have here shows two things. First of all, it shows numbers going from 74 to 
88, and that's me counting up on my 100 missions, okay? Mm -hmm. So that was a significant month for me to, to get missions. But there's a bunch of names in there as well, and that's names of guys that were, were in the squadron with me, or in, in the wing. We had three squadrons in the wing. Those were guys that were in the, the wing with me that were shot down during that time. Some of them uh, made it back, some of them were prisoners of war, mm -hmm. some of them, probably some we never knew. There, there's one on the 17th of October that says Sully plus two. There, we were going up to a, a bridge across a river just east of Hanoi one day. I was in the second flight of four. The, the flight that was the lead flight, number one, started their roll in, and as they did, the number two guy, instead of swinging under the leader and then slipping past him, slid right up toward him and then ducked under him. Well, right at that instant, they, they hit number one. His airplane pitched down right on the nose of number two. Was he, was he hit or why? He, he was hit by 57 millimeter. Okay. okay a direct, direct hit. His airplane pitched down. He, he hit the nose of number two. I, I was back over here just, just a few thousand feet, okay? And I could see these two airplanes, see the nose of, of number one, and see fuel tanks and bombs come flying off, and then it was just a fireball. Mm. Well, about four years later, these two guys bumped into each other in the, in the Hanoi Hilton, and a guy says, Sully, how'd you get in here? And he said, well, you son of a bitch, you blew, right up, blew up right in my face. <laughs> so, <laughs> they both little, survived little humor. Yeah, and they both survived. Wow. Now, the really sad, th the thing that was even sadder was that three and four from that flight continued on down the slide, dropped their bombs, and started their turn out. Number four was a new guy, typically, and one of the things we were taught was never get directly behind another airplane, because the gunners will typically be aiming at him, but, but not leading him far enough, and will hit the guy behind. And so as they continued their, their pullout, they hit number four, and he went straight in. Mm. So. Three out of four airplanes lost out of that one. Wow, so that's the Sully plus yeah, two. Yeah, that's Sully plus two, okay. Wow. Down on the 27th, you see Flynn. Uh, Flynn was our wing commander. He'd only been there, probably I don't remember exactly, but probably five or six weeks. This is a full colonel, a, a really good guy. As we approached a target just north of Hanoi, uh, the first clue that we were going to get missiles fired at us was that we got radio warning that all of the MiGs, all of the airplanes for the North Vietnamese had headed for China. So when they get out of the, out of the area, you know you're going to eat, eat SAMs, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, as we approached the target, SAM started coming up. The, the first one anybody saw was we call them out, and the flight, the element leader said, hold your pod formation, it's not guiding, which means that the jamming was working, okay? But then they started coming up in flights of two and three, just right up our noses, and they were going through. So the, you're seeing these telephone poles fly in front of you, and yeah, and beside side. you, and you got your thumb in your mouth flying <laughs> the airplane with the other hand. Okay. <clears throat> well, two of them went past uh, Colonel Flynn, who was in the in the lead lead flight of four. Two of them went past him. The third one skewered him right in the belly, and there was nothing but a fireball. We we thought he was dead. We didn't hear an emergency sh beeper. We didn't, nobody saw a shoot or anything. Turned out he was, he survived and he was prisoner of war and he was the senior ranking Air Force officer in it. Came out a two or three star general. Mm. And, uh, and a great guy. Glad he survived. Okay. Uh, go back up to, to the 7th of October, Howard and Chambly. I've got a, another picture that I'll show you about them. Uh, <clears throat> This, this is a picture taken from the belly of the F-105. We had a camera that, that took a, a, I've forgotten, 70 millimeter uh, strip of film that started at the nose of the airplane and scanned to the tail, and then it would do it again and again. That picture of Kep Airfield that I showed this you. This looks like a, like a panoramic shot? Yeah, thing? yeah. Okay. What you got was a strip of film about, about that long and about that wide that was all a continuous okay. picture, okay? That the picture of Kep that I showed you was taken by an airplane behind my flight that, that, with this camera. A, a MiG attack, in fact, two MiG-21s attacked a flight that was coming out of, of the target area. Uh, the guy in the airplane that's taken this picture, you'll notice he still has bombs on, mm -hmm. but the streak at the bottom is a missile that, that he had fired that uh, 
that went toward a, a wild weasel airplane. Now, I didn't talk about yeah, wild weasels. Yeah, it's a wild weasel. The, there, was a, there was a fifth flight of 4105s that's, whose job was to keep the SAMs down, to, to protect the strike force from the SAMs. They had a special electronic gear. Two of the airplanes would be two-place 105s, and the guy in the back was, was an electronic warfare officer. He had all this extra instruments that he could, could tell which radars on the ground were, were operating, which ones were tracking, were they in the tracking mode? That was the, Navy gear, wasn't it, initially? No. Well, what was the... Okay, I'm, no. I'm mixing <laughs> stories up. There, there were two... <coughs> the, the Navy had the same kind of a mission. They had right. they had A6s that could do the same thing. But but these were Air Force guys. Okay. It was, it was a very, very dangerous mission when I got over there. They had been flying it for about three years, and no crew had finished 100 missions yet flying these things. When I got there, they, they took a different tactic, and that was to suppress the, the SAMs. And, and I don't know if I have time to go into detail on, on how we did that. How much time? Got all the time in the world. Oh, you only have like two more hours of memory oh. there. So. Well, I can, I can do that then. <laughs> uh, this, this flight of four would go in ahead about 10 miles in front of the four, 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 four ship flights, 16 bomb carrying airplanes. The weasels would be ahead of them. The electronic warfare officers looking in the target area to see what radars were up and what modes they were in. If they, were, they could tell if they were just searching, if they were actually tracking. They could tell if they were tracking the, the guys that they cared about. They could tell if they were in the launch mode and then the guidance yeah. mode. So, so they could be pretty much on top of it. If a SAM site turned on, then this flight would, would attack them with anti-radiation missiles. These were missiles called Shrikes that we would fire and they would they would go at the radar okay <coughs> if if nobody uh, originally when I first got over there they were playing a hunter killer thing they would try to find one and go and see if they could do it and so they were trading uh, you know twenty million dollar F-105 for twenty thousand dollar missiles and losing and losing everybody okay I was gonna say losing a lot of guys but they finally decided that if they went into a defense suppression mode, in other words, keep the SAMs from firing and from tracking, that they could get the airplanes in, get the bombs on the target, and everybody go home. And, and so that was what they had, had done toward the second half of, of my, uh, so my how, tour. So how did they do that? Well, okay, they'd be out in front of the strike force. If, if a site came up and was active, they would attack it. If it didn't, then, then probably five miles from, from the target, number one and two would pull up and fire shrikes in a big arc toward the target area. Now, if a radar turned on, he'd eat it. Okay. So the idea was to keep the radars turned off so they can't track or launch or, or guide. Then they'd swing around behind the strike force and come in again behind him, and three and four would pull up and fire another set of shrikes over the top of the, of the guys just before we would be ready to roll in and, and drop the bombs. And, and it was really effective. This particular day, the MiGs attacked one of those flights coming out. Okay? So the missile that, that's coming, uh, that you can see coming across the bottom of the picture was going at the leader of, of this flight, and that was Howard and Chambly that were number uh, on October 7th on the previous target. The guy that was flying this airplane saw the missile called to, to Howard and Chambly and told them that you're being tracked and then, then at the right second he yelled break and the F-105 what you did was you pulled the stick all the way back to your to your lap and made the airplane just kind of stand up on its tail you could stand it up this way or, or this way or, or anything and, and try to make this this missile that's looking at the tailpipe looking at the heat of the engine through the tailpipe miss the airplane a little bit okay you couldn't make it completely missed. Hmm. So here's a picture of their airplane. You'll notice there's two, two cockpits, two helmets there. Mm -hmm. if, if you look closely, you'll see that only one wing tank is on, the one on the near side. Yeah. And you'll see that it's streaming fuel from that tank. You can see that it's streaming fuel and hydraulic fluid from the, hmm. from the belly of the airplane. You'll see on the left wing, there's a lot of sheet metal that's gone and, and sticking up in, in the air. And, and the right wing the, the little flaps you see sticking up were, were spoilers that provided the, the roll control. We had ailerons, the conventional ailerons, but for that airplane you needed more effect than that. So those spoilers would, <coughs> would 
pop up. So they're popped up to try to offset the fact that they're that they got a tank on one side mm -hmm. and no tank on the other and, and a lot of damage. They ended up making it to the coast, uh, flew out and actually flew down to South Vietnam and ejected over a hospital ship. <laughs> <clears throat> Their ejection didn't go well. They both broke both legs. And, and that was a problem that we were having with the F-105. The, the ejection seat was designed to be fired while your feet were forward and on the rudder pedals. And then your, your body was sitting on your thighs and your, and your butt, okay? Other airplanes, you put the, your feet back against the seat, okay, so that they didn't hit the instrument panel and the, and the canopy as you went out. So guys that, that in, the, in the panic of the moment, would revert back to the old technique, would have their feet up against the seat. Now when, when the seat starts to move, your knees are in the air. And by the time your butt catches up and the seat hits the bottom of your legs, your, your, your foreleg and your shoes and everything aren't going any place, but your body is. And so they got bending fractures right in the middle of their thighs. Ooh. And, and you know, we kept talking it and talking it and talking it and talking it that, uh, that some guys broke their legs anyway. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, Joe Howard, who was the pilot in the front seat, later on, 1976, bicentennial celebration at Dulles Air Force Base, flying with the Thunderbirds, was killed in a crash at Dulles. So, mm -hmm. so his career was kind of kind of kind of tainted. Okay. And then on the way home, you know, typically we'd hit the tanker again. If we were flying a, a mission, Route Pack 5 or Laos, we didn't need more fuel. If you were way up in Route Pack 6, or if, if, you had, if you went in there by way of the Gulf and the DMZ, you always needed fuel coming home. Uh, guys that had trouble getting fuel going in never had trouble getting fuel coming back. <laughs> There's just something about it. Uh, something different about this picture, first of all, there are bombs on the airplane, so it obviously we weren't going home yeah. when this picture was taken. But you can see the, the white jamming pod on the near wing of the, of the closest airplane, the pod so with the little stems. It looks, like, looks like a bomb, but... It looks or, like a bomb, but those are, those are antennas okay. that, that broadcast in the frequencies of the, the SAM radars. And back at the base, everything was peace and quiet. Hey, that's you. About four hours per mission on the average, about 10 minutes in the high threat area, and the rest of the year was really nice. You know, we got to sit by the pool and play racquetball and drink iced tea. And Did, pet oh, wait, what, was, what was the psychological effect of that, though? The fact that you were in the heat of the battle and then back by the pool? Well, you knew you had to get up and go again. <laughs> yeah. That's why you counted the missions. Okay. Mm. So, so you know that the story was that up to ten missions, the saying was there ain't no way. Okay, and, and from ten to fifty, maybe there's a way, and from fifty to ninety, there must be a way. <laughs> okay, and then there is a way. When when we got ninety five missions, they called us sterile, and you didn't have to go to the route pack six targets. You could go the the easier ones down in route pack one and two hmm. and, until you finished up. So I remember this picture uh, as a kid and then later as a teenager and you know uh, for a time I thought wow dad actually was cool at one point then I noticed the black socks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, I hadn't yeah. learned yet. Yeah. White socks you wear with a suit and black socks you wear with a white suit. I was skinnier then. like an engineer. Yeah, I, I lost 10 pounds during that year, and, and uh, some of it was because it was 110 degrees and 110 humidity like North Carolina, and the other was just the, the stress. We had good food. Uh, actually, we had, had very good food. Do we have time for the story about Roscoe? Yeah, sure. Tell us about Roscoe. Roscoe was a, was a Japanese police dog, and uh, the F-105 wings in Japan and, and Okinawa, at that time Okinawa was not part of Japan again yet, <clears throat> and, and their guys would come over for about six weeks on a, on a temporary duty tour and fly missions until they got their hundred. One of the guys from Japan brought this dog, brought Roscoe down in the cockpit of the 105 as, as a pup. Hmm. When he got there, the, the officials raised cane uh, because the status of forces agreement with with the Thai government was that we couldn't bring any animals in. And uh, you know, they had to provide all of our, our, our food and, and, and the like. <laughs> Wait a second, <laughs> they saw you brought in a dog and they were concerned that you were bringing in food? Well, that too, yeah. <laughs> no, any, any critter, okay, other than right. human critters. 
Uh, so the guy talked him into letting him stay, stay there for the six weeks he was going to be there, then he would fly him home. Well, he got shot down. Mm -hmm. And by that time, the, <coughs> the base had fallen in love with him, and uh, he became the base mascot. Uh, he had all kinds of privileges. He would ride down to our briefings in the, in the squadron commander's pickup truck. And, and at the front of our briefing room, there were overstuffed chairs for the wing commander, deputy chief of operations, maintenance, supply, and Roscoe. And these were, slip, <laughs> these were names on the backs of the slip covers. One day, Roscoe came in, and the door, the entry to the briefing room was on the side. He came in and kind of stood in the door and looked back and forth walked to the back of the room and crawled under a stand and laid down. And someone said, what's with Roscoe? He needs to go on R&R. &R. Now, if, if you don't know, every six weeks we went off flying duty. The rule was you, you can't fly during that time. Uh, it was best if you got off base and went to Thailand or Japan. So it was or, west and relaxation. Right? West and relaxation, yeah. <laughs> and uh, everybody said, you know, it's time for Roscoe to go on R&R &R, because there's something wrong with him. Well, that day was when we got the, had the three guys go down in that one, hmm. one flight. Well, the next day when Roscoe came in, <laughs> all eyes were on Roscoe. And if he'd gone to the back of the room, nobody would have flown. Okay. So, anyway, a, a lot of neat, neat stories about him. Uh, the rule was you don't abuse Roscoe in any way. Uh, guys who, who thought this was stupid and, and would push him out of the way, would get shot down. Mm. Don't ask me to explain it, it just happened. When you finished your 100 missions, you fed Roscoe a steak. And Roscoe liked his steak medium rare, <laughs> cut up bite size, and fed with a fork. <laughs> <laughs> and he would stand there and eat it like a man. <laughs> we, got a, we got a new base vet in one time, and first day he got to sit at the wing commander's table at lunch. And typically Roscoe came trotting in with some of the guys, and he says, What's that dog doing in here? And everybody says, that's Roscoe. Says, What's a Roscoe? Well, that's our mascot. Get him out of here. Two o'clock, the guy was on a C-141 going to his next assignment. Wow. <laughs> he didn't last today. <laughs> you didn't mess with Roscoe. Roscoe pull rank? Is that what happened? Yeah, Roscoe had everybody pulling rank for him. Okay. So that's, that's the story. Thanks for your attention, Scott <laughs> and friends. Now, I, I have a couple questions for okay. you. You, and you know, I, I didn't, I don't know that I've ever shared the story with you guys. Um, when my son was going to turn 13, um, a good buddy of mine also had a son about to turn 13. And we got to discussing about how um, in other religions that they had sort of a coming of age ceremony around that time. And we decided that, well, we were going to do something like that for our boys. And we did. And um, the, the way it kind of went down for Seth, or boy as you guys know him, um, he didn't know what was up, but he, he did know we were driving from Columbus, from Dayton to Columbus to get home and uh, stopped at a park and the sun was going down. And we had been talking about a number of things that related to growing up and responsibility and so on. And uh, I pulled the car over at the state park and I said, so Seth, do you want to be a man? Yeah, sure, Dad. And I said, well, then get out of the car and start walking down this road. You know, like I said, this was a, a park. There, there were no street lights. And uh, so he starts walking down the road and looking back, wondering what was going on. And then coming out of the uh, cornfield alongside was one of my buddies. And he steps out and says, Seth, I hear you want to be a man. And he walked and he talked to my son for about a half hour about a, a particular topic that we had pre-assigned for him to discuss. And and this went on and on and on uh, with him passing from one of my buddies to another of my buddies to my brother-in-law um, and then ultimately to my dad who he had not seen in a couple years mm -hmm. and uh, you spoke with him on the topic of, do you recall? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you talked about um, expecting God's, God's greater, greater reward, reward. Yeah. and that, uh, you know, you talked uh, about how you would have those momentary victories, and those were great, but ultimately, you know, we're in this for uh, something greater. Mm -hmm. And you gave him something. We all, at the end, we kind of did a recap around the campfire as we ate steak and baked potatoes, and we all recapped what we had talked to my son about, and then everybody gave him some sort of memento to remember that event. And 
as I came here, we're sitting at, by the way, this is Boy's house right now. Yeah. Um, I noticed what he has in his, in his living room here. Okay. Stand by, this will be edited out. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. So, actually, he has all the things that he received from the various men, but this is what my dad gave Seth. You guys can see that. What is that, Dad? That's a distinguished flying cross. All right, and oh, and you had a plaque made that says Seth's thirteenth birthday expects expect God's greater reward, Grandpa Markwood. So, what is this about? Well, we we got medals for the the, the easiest medal was we got an air medal for flying ten missions. So I got ten air medals for flying my hundred. Uh, plus a couple other air medals for for missions that had particular accomplishments. I don't I don't remember the details. Uh, if you accomplish something greater, uh, we would get the Distinguished Flying Cross, which is is a fairly prestigious medal. Uh, I earned six of those in the time, and then for one night mission, single ship, low altitude. Um, my buddy and I we were flying a two place 105 got the Silver Star. And what, what was that? What? Well, there was, there was about a week long build up. Uh, we were getting, getting missions that assigned us to, to go up and fly toward a target that was out in that Red River Valley area called Fu Tho. And when we got to the, to the area that the SAMs became a threat, then we would turn away from it and go up to a railroad target that was up along the Red River that was in a, a little safer area, much more mountainous. Uh, for, for those missions that we were just doing this feint towards Fu Tho, uh, they would assign the anti-SAM airplane that, that supported us and a jamming airplane. We had EB-66s, which were, were a two-engine bomber that had a lot of jamming equipment worthless but a lot of it okay and they would assign them up to our primary target and so the the feint was obviously a feint until we were ready to go there for real well about a, a week later sure enough they they assigned us to a target that was in the vicinity of Fu Tho clearly inside the SAM ring and and one that a mobile SAM you know they could put SAMs on a trailer along with their radar and move them around the country and those were really the, the difficult ones because they could pop up anywhere the day before this mission was assigned, uh, one of them had, had shown up just across the river from the target that, that was assigned and shot down a recce airplane, a reconnaissance uh, F-101, RF-101. So sure enough, we got this, this mission assigned, and sure enough, as we forecast, the wild weasel and the, and the radar jamming airplane were assigned to that same area. So talk about a giveaway. Mm -hmm. and we decided we had to do something that would, would not give ourselves away. <clears throat> So we talked, we, we planned the mission to go uh, up into northern uh, Laos where there was a, a navigation station called a Channel 97. And we were going to go up at low altitude and the weasel airplane was going to be at high altitude flying as close as possible the same track that we were. So one above the other. Hopefully if they were tracking anybody, they were tracking them. When we got to Channel 97, then we, we scheduled it to, to have us both turn and head north of the target, we had, we had to get about a 10 mile run in to get to find the target, get the radar locked on and, and, and uh, release the bombs. So they, they were to fly the same one. When we got to, the, to Channel 97, they were supposed to say Alpha over the radio. And, and when they said oh, Alpha, we were just at that second passing the, the station. So we knew they were where we wanted them. When, when we got to the, to the river, that was the turn point, they were supposed to say Bravo. And again, they were locked on. And then they were to turn and head back up north, up toward the railroad yards where we'd gone before. We turned right and went down this river valley, about 500 feet, 700 feet above the, above the water. Now this is black, black, black night. And we're using 1950 radar to do this. With and no head headlights. And no headlights, you better believe it. Now, we had this EB-66 to deal with too. When we, when we got off the tanker and headed up north, we called the EB-66 and says, we're canceling the mission, go home. Because we, we knew they weren't any help and they were just going to give us away if they followed their mission. Hmm. So they went home, the weasels stayed locked above us until we got up there, turned right and headed down the valley. 
and found the target, locked on the, the fire control system. I had to lock it on five miles out, and, and then the bombs release automatically when we get there. <clears throat> now, because of this SAM site that had been just across the river, now this would be, as we, as we approach the target, it would be back at about four o'clock, five o'clock. <clears throat> Uh, we knew that he was a was good chance of being there, but there was a nice little ridge just beyond the target. So we planned that after we dropped the bombs, we'd do a little, a little jink to the side, look to see where the bombs hit, and then turn behind that ridge in case the sand went off. Well, <clears throat> as we were turning, uh, John was my, my, he was the pilot that night, and, and as he turned, instead of flying a level turn, he kind of pulled the nose up. And we could see this big flash back there of a missile mm. lifting off. And I looked at the radar and at the altimeter and yelled at the altitude to him and said, get back down. And, and we could see this missile in the, out of the corner of our eye. And as we dropped down below the ridge, he disappeared and then went boom. So, <laughs> so we flew him right into the ridge. Now, the, the rest of the story is when we got back to the base, you know, we were very elated that it worked just exactly the way we planned. And after we'd fly a mission, we'd always go up to the officers' club and you'd get some coffee to relax with and a fat pill of some kind. Well, our, our weasel crew was sitting at the table and, and their cups were just kind of shattering on the tabletop with their shaking hands and their eyes were about this big. And, and they said, you SOBs, you nearly got us killed. And we said, what happened to you? They said, well, it was so quiet back there that after we turned up north, we decided to swing back around. Well, they went out over the <laughs> Red River Valley where the missiles were, and as soon as our bombs went off and they fired the missile on us, they fired a whole bunch of missiles with them. Now, mm -hmm. you're, when you're single ship, even if you have the jamming pods on, they can track you, okay? And so at that point, the only thing you can do would be to, to put the missile vis visually at your wingtip and just keep turning until you see it starting to, to approach you, and you can see it because the the exhaust would, would elongate. In the daytime, you can see the, the telephone pole start to show, and you put four, five, six Gs on the airplane, and it would go under you and miss and go off. Hmm. And they wrestled about eight missiles, again, pitch black night, so they didn't know whether they were upside down or right side up. Oh, <laughs> so we said, we didn't kill you, you, did it, you committed suicide. So, Anyway, that was the Silver Star mission. It was, it wow. was one where, where we took on a job that was, was almost impossible and planned it well and flew it well and Pretty survived neat. it well. All so. right. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing this with Seth. You're welcome. It, it obviously means a lot to him. All right. So, you know, the last time that uh, when I posted that video, there were several people who left comments that I think that you, you should hear. So let me let me go to the Ipodius Maximus. Yeah, I don't want to hear all the nice ones. Oh no, it's, the, it's the bad ones. Give me the bad ones. Yeah, <laughs> I can deal with those. Uh, thank you, Colonel Markwood, for your service to our great country. Not wasn't as bad as I remember. No. Today. Um, amazing man, your dad. Um, if you want to hear some of uh, of what he experienced, check out Craig Baker's F fifteen uh, F one hundred five site. It contains quite a bit of audio recordings during F one hundred five airstrikes over North Vietnam by some very brave men. Have you ever heard of that? I've, yeah, I've checked some of that. Have you? Yeah. Are, are you on there? They talked way too much. <laughs> Um, great video, Scott. Thank you, Colonel, for your service, and well done, sir. Um, th this was actually in response to the guy who our response was in response to. Okay. I told you my buddy Jay posted the video about justice, mm -hmm. and we if you haven't seen that video, we, we talked about um, uh, the president's decision to drop the bombs in Japan. And that was in response to Jay, D-I-G-H-S-X. And he responded, first off, great video. Second, big thanks to your dad for his service. As for dropping the bomb, he's absolutely right. I lost my grandfather on Okinawa about four months before they dropped the bomb. Well, that's bad timing. Mm. Um, I really need to do a video about war. Yes, you do. War should be avoided at all costs, but if you go to war, it should be an all-out and nothing held. Uh, should be all-out, nothing held back. 
Um, sometimes you just got to put boot to ass, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like Jay. Uh, God bless your dad and all our servicemen and women past, present, and future from a Navy vet, ahoy. Mm -hmm. Captain Nemo 49 wrote that. Um, great video, Scott. Thank you and your father for his service. Looking forward to the next video. That was uh, looking forward to this video right okay. here. Okay. Thank you, Dad. So, you know what? Uh, oh, um, Scott, uh, a great idea to have your dad explain why we dropped the bomb. Revisionist history is dangerous and practice way too often. I'm glad to see Jay's response to your video. Me too. Mm -hmm. um, and all the rest of these are about how wonderful you are. So I, I appreciate that, guys. I did throw up in my mouth a little bit, but <laughs> actually, uh, a wonderful man to grow up with as a father, I can tell you that. And uh, thank you for your service, Dan. Thank you. So, should we talk about anything else while we have the camera in front of us? Maybe we can do a do a follow up to this one. Well, do you have any? Do you have anything planned with your sisters? You know, I have to go get my lawn mowed. So, maybe oh. gotta, what did they call you and talk to you about tonight? Yeah. What's the plan? After I get the lawn mowed. After you get the mowed. Mower. Okay. All right. Well, guys, thank you. Thank you for watching. And uh, Dad, thank you again. You're welcome. All right.